What's going on guys? It's master horticulturalist and YouTube superstar Paul Outlaw here. I got like 15 subscribers, you can't mess with me. My order from the Grass Factor store came in less than a week. They didn't use my credit card number to steal my identity and my hat looks great. Thanks Matt and the Grass Factor store. isn't just about lawn care. The Grass Factor is about the science behind why we do what we do. So we are stewards of the environment. We are stewards of the planet. It is our responsibility. What's up, YouTube? Okay, if you live in the eastern half of the United States, even you probably experienced a significant amount of rain. We didn't get that much. We probably got over the last two weeks, maybe three inches, something like that. So it wasn't too terribly oppressive. However, we have been experiencing high temperatures and high humidity. What does that mean for fescue lawns? That means brown patch development. So when we're talking about brown patch, typically the conditions we're looking for are days over 85, nights at 60 to 65. And once you have that over a, getting, over a given set of days, you're going to see development of disease unless you put down material to prevent the development of disease. And there's gonna be a thousand ways to argue this that you can prevent it organically. Uh, organic practices are going to minimize it you know, keep your nitrogen rates low, keep your nitrogen rates high. Uh, there's a million different theories about it. However, let's talk about the facts of brown patch. Rhizoctonia salini is a natural occurring bacteria in all soils. It only becomes present when the conditions are conducive for the development of disease. In this particular instance, the development of Rhizoctonia salini is looking for temperatures at 85 and above during the day, 60, 65 and above at night, and a general relatively high humidity through the course of the day. Let me show you what it looks like as it begins to develop on fescue. Now what we have here is the development of brown patch. Let's look at this tissue sample here. So you can see the damage on the leaf tissue there. Let's look at this one. A little earlier stage. You see the damage there. This one. So again, that is what our brown patch looks like. Now, um, oddly, this brown patch here is not spreading. Doesn't seem to be doing anything. It's been in these same spots the last couple of days. Um, in terms of organic practices um, and nitrogen content, I'll kind of run you down of what's been put on my yard so far. Right now, we've only put down one and a half pounds of nitrogen on my front yard. Of course, I have put down um, two gallons to the acre of RGS, maybe more. I went with a really high rate of air eight on my front yard. Um, not a lot, not a lot at all actually has been, has been put on here. In fact, I've, I barely even cut it. I've only cut my front yard maybe four times or so. So what I'm, what I'm getting at is that, what I'm getting at is that the predictability of brown patch, very, very difficult to say where it's definitely going to happen. So for instance, my yard is pretty open. It's got a little bit of shade. Um, it's in a shaded area where it has it. It could be that it's retaining moisture here a little more. It probably is retaining moisture more here than it is on the far side of my yard. The brown patch seems to be concentrated right here along the driveway. Um, this part of the driveway is going to catch a lot more runoff 
uh, especially from you know the gravel so I would be willing to bet that I've got a, a higher pH in this area and that could be a contributing factor to it it's not to say that a high pH means you're gonna get brown patch you know but typically acidic soils do not contribute to the development of brown patch now that's not a written in stone rule just because you have acidic soil doesn't mean you're gonna get brown patch I can take you to 20, 20 lawns right here in this area that all have brown patch and they've all got acidic soil. It's just another contributing factor in the overall scheme of things. So when you're deciding on what to do with it, why I have it, just because you do everything correctly does not mean you're not going to have the development of disease. You know, the first principle of organic farming is right plant, right place. We are in the transition zone in particular here with our fescue. Being in the transition zone, that means we're too hot for fescue and technically we're too cold for Bermuda. And so what we're left with is choosing between a turf type that can't tolerate our summers or a turf type that can't tolerate our winters. So to combat that, what the researchers try and do is genetically modify our grass types to be able to tolerate the more extremes of the weather that we're going to face based on our regionality. This is genetically modified seed, the best that they could get. This was the best I could get my hands on. And I've done everything right. I have never, I have yet to water my yard. Not once. I've maintained it high. Well, I did mow it really, really, really low one time. But for the most part, I've maintained it high. And I still have, I've used the biostimulants and I still have disease. And again, we do the best we can culturally to keep from having to do things chemically. Unfortunately, where we are, it's one of those things where we have to intervene chemically because what we did culturally simply wasn't enough. So, what am I gonna do? Spray it with some fungicide. Let's talk about what I'm gonna use first. Everyone asked me what I apply to treat fungus. The active ingredient in this is azoxystrobin. The rate on this on a 28 day residual plus curative is 32 ounces to the acre. This is PPZ 41.8. This is a 41.8% active ingredient propiconazole. This is a very, very high active propiconazole. See there, 41.8. The rate on this at a curative with a 14 day residual is 32 ounces to the acre. So what we're dealing with here are two fungicides from two different classes. We have a group three and a group 11, a strobilurin and a DMI, and we're going to combine them to attack the plant, to attack the disease from two different modes of actions. Now, I modeled this after a name brand product by Syngenta called Headway. Headway is a combination of azoxystrobin and propiconazole. Again, the whole premise behind the development of that product was to attack diseases from two different points, from two different modes of action. And the results from it were incredibly successful, and so that's why I decided to roll my own. Now, what's interesting is by combining the two the synergy between them means you can drop the rates of each. So when I run these two products, I run half rates of each combined to still get the curative aspect of it plus the 28 day residual. If you want to know more aspects of combining them or where to buy it, um, I helped the lawn care nut Alan Hain with uh, his fungicide guide. So. Be sure and check that out, show him some love. And uh, anyway, he did a really, really excellent write-up. I just supplied some of the technical details. So if you want to know where to find it, uh, be sure and check out what he has on his fungicide guide. 
Okay, so now let's go from here. We know we are attacking from two different modes of action. What does that mean? So one of the biggest things we're risked with, we're facing right now in the industry is resistance from either herbicides um, or fungicides or pesticides. Pesticide resistance is a very, very real thing. Not only do we increase our overall efficacy by combining two products, we actually also decrease our chance for resistance. And let me tell you why. Because when you're going after it from two different points of view, that's two different mutations that have to occur in order for that disease to become resistant to that fungicide. The more actives, the more modes of action, the more groups you can throw in there, typically the better overall results that you can get. Now, the issue with brown patch is that we're limited in what we're labeled for residential lawns to control. Um, a lot of what's labeled for golf, you know, your groups ones and twos, you know, your chlorothalonils, smankazeb, those actually have very, very, very low resistance opportunities. Chlorothalonil actually attacks from many, 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 many different ways. Uh, it has one group, but I want to say that like there's over 300 different points of attack from chlorothalonil. So in terms of resistance, the potential for resistance to develop to chlorothalonil is extremely low next to zero, as close as you could say to zero. It's just that would be a significant amount of genetic mutations that have to take place in the right timings in order for a disease to become resistant to chlorothalonil. I combine these two, it gives me two modes of actions, it mitigates my risk for fungicide resistance, and it delivers results. Let's go ahead and get a spray. Okay, so I didn't spray the entire yard and that was by design. I kind of want to document what exactly happens with this mix over the next couple of weeks. All right, y'all, that's going to get it for the video. If you have questions about your fertility programs and taking your fertility programs to the next level, I recommend you check out Lawn Ecology. That's my good buddy John Perry over there, man in that. If you need overall total programs, I recommend you check out my buddy Pete Denny with GCI Turf or my buddy Alan Hayne, the Lawn Care Nut. Worked with both of those guys. And uh, if there's any merchandise you want, I got a link in the description down below. Big thanks to Outlaw Paul for uh, complimentary words. All right, y'all, I appreciate it. Have a good one. Take it easy.